so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It's February 18, 1951, and convicted murderer Jean Lee is spending her final night alive in D Division at Victoria's Pentridge Prison. Earlier in the evening, she was dragged into the wing, a place known as the House of Horrors, kicking, screaming and clawing. She's adamant she's innocent, even though she initially confessed to the crime she's been condemned for. There's about a thousand odd prisoners being housed around her, but Jean is the only woman. D Division is a place of bashings and shankings, a vile and violent section of the notorious prison complex. But she won't be there long. In the morning, she'll be led to the wing's gallows, another morbid reason it's so despised. She's been convicted of murdering a bookmaker called William Pop Kent, alongside her lover Bobby and another male accomplice. Pop was bound to a chair, tortured with the aim of finding hidden money, and finally strangled. All three accused were sentenced to death. For the last few months, Jean has become more and more erratic, staging hunger strikes, lashing out at guards and throwing food. Tonight, on her final night, she's been given a sedative to help her sleep. At 7.55am tomorrow, wearing a pale yellow skirt and a white blouse, Jean will be escorted, barely conscious, to the gallows. By 8.05am, she will be pronounced dead, 469 days after her initial arrest. Her co-accused will die side by side two hours later. Jean will go down in history as the last woman to be judicially executed in Australia and the only woman in this country to be executed in the 20th century. But she's not the only story worth knowing from behind the walls of Pentridge Prison. During its 147 years in operation, the Victorian institution became known as this country's most infamous jail. A hardened and dangerous prison with a troubled reputation for housing Australia's most dangerous criminals. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. For more than a century, Pentridge Prison was an ominous presence just 30 minutes away from Melbourne's CBD. Located in the suburb of Coburg, the final iteration of the prison was a sea of six-metre-high bluestone walls with barbed wire on the top. Sitting on 160 acres of land, it looked like a medieval castle surrounded by huge cyclone fences. It was a place of murder and mayhem, described by former inmates as the worst prison Australia has ever seen. It was home to Victoria's worst criminals, everyone from Ned Kelly and Chopper Reed to mass murderers Julian Knight, the Hoddle Street shooter, and Craig Minogue, the Russell Street bomber. Pentridge officially closed on the 1st of May 1997 after decades of controversy. Over the years, everybody in Victoria had an understanding that Pentridge was a bad place, and the criminals who spent time inside can attest to that. They describe it as hell. James Phelps is an award-winning senior reporter for The Daily Telegraph and Sunday Telegraph in Sydney, who in recent years has devoted his time to documenting true crime stories in a number of books. In his latest, Australia's Most Infamous Jail, he explores what life was really like behind the bluestone walls of Pentridge. He joins us now. And just before you hear from James, please be aware that some of the descriptions in this episode are extremely graphic and violent. James, I'm going to ask you for a little bit of a history lesson first up. When did Pentridge Prison first open? It's got an amazing history. 
A lot of people think it began as a jail straight up, but it didn't. It began with 12 convicts and a couple of guards. So they got marched from Melbourne jail in 1850 out to a place called Coburg, which back then was like the middle of nowhere. It's only eight kilometres north of Melbourne's CBD. It's like a thriving little suburb now. It is, but back then Melbourne was a clearing with only a couple of thousand people and it was just bush. So they got sent up. They walked most of the way. The guards were in carts that they took with them and it was a clearing that had been cleared away and a hut. And that was the first Pentridge Dale. And the reason they were sent there was to build a road, which is Sydney Road. So it was a chain gang. And the prisons had many iterations over the years, which we're going to get into. But I want to talk about the first iteration. It's called the Crystal Palace. Firstly, why? Can you give us a bit of a background as to that? Yes. So you've got to understand a little bit of the history of Victoria to understand Pentridge. And as I said, first of all, this place was just a jail road gang. They were there to build Sydney Road. It was really rich in bluestone. So they started that. But everybody knows what happened in Victoria shortly after that. They found gold. Mm. So there's this huge explosion of people. The population rose to 100,000, 300,000, 500,000 in a matter of years. And with that came crime. So all of a sudden, the old Melbourne jail, which was the only jail they had, was completely full. And they started using hulks, which were old abandoned ships. And they very horrible. But Pentridge was the next site. So they started just putting up buildings haphazardly. And they couldn't really contain the prisoners and there was no management. And they had some of the worst ruffian criminals in Australia because they'd come from everywhere, off the boat from every sort of country and they were getting up to all sorts of crime. So a way to control them is a governor had this fantastic idea to make a punishment prison. So he built this place called the Crystal Palace. It was the first jail in Pentridge that actually had real walls. And they were big log walls. They had scaffolding where the guards walked along at night. And inside, it was an open area. There was no roof. And they had basically horse carts that had been converted with bars. And they'd lock the inmates in there at night, up to 10 of them in this tiny little horse cart. So they weren't even beds. Mm -hmm. And they had to go to the toilet in there. And sometimes they were kept in there for 23 hours a day. Wow. And they were given bread and water. And if that wasn't bad enough, they had punishments like putting people to the stone. So there was actually a big stone with a uh, shackle put on it and they would cuff someone and leave them there for up to three months. So out in the- Three months? Out in the Melbourne weather. You could imagine there's not a better place in Australia to be out in the middle of winter, is there? Except for, I guess, Tassie. How do you even survive something like that? Some of them didn't. Back then, obviously, the reporting wasn't what it should be and people got away with things that they couldn't do. But, yeah, there were certainly deaths in custody. Can you take us through some of the other punishments? Because that wasn't the only thing they did, put them to the stone. What else could you expect at the Crystal Palace? Whippings, floggings. So right up until 1964, I think it was, floggings were legal in Australia. And you think of floggings, you don't really understand the punishment involved and what happens. Mm. We're talking about flesh ripped from your bones. After five or six lashes, you've got bones exposed. So they're supposed to lash you on the back, but often the lashes would wrap around your stomach and to your front of your torso. And another story that is in the book is the last man that was actually flogged in Australia. His name is William O'Mealy. It happened in H Division. So he was tied to a whipping post and he was given 12 lashes and, yeah, his, his ribs were exposed. What did you do to get a whipping in prison? Anything. It could be speaking at the wrong time. It could be not going to church. The punishment phase of prisons ended shortly after that, towards the turn of the century, mm-hmm. and they became penitentiaries. So the word penitent is in penitentiary, mm-hmm. and that meant that you go there to reform. You'd be penitent for your sins. And it was very church-based. And they came up with a system called the silent and separate system. So you'd go in and you wouldn't speak to anybody for six months. So you'd be locked in a cell for 23 hours a day by yourself. When you were let out, you actually had to put a bag on your head so nobody could see you. Everyone was equal. It didn't matter about what your crime was. That was the theory that you were there and you'd come out a new person. And yard time was a bag on your head walking around a circle for an hour. Like a see-through bag? Like no, a, no. You so you couldn't, couldn't see? You couldn't or, see. Oh. So they didn't want you seeing other inmates or associating because it had to be completely silent. It was a time for reflection. For six so, months? Yeah, inward thinking. Yeah, for up to six months, you'd get taken out in a yard by yourself and then they'd take the bag off. But there were, if there were others in the yard, you'd have to walk around with the bag on your head. 
and the only reading material that they were given was the Bible. But yeah, that prison, it developed over the years and the Crystal Palace was the, the first sort of punishment area. And then they started constructing these huge bluestone blocks. So E Division, which still stands today, was actually the first, but it was used mostly as a hospital back then. So the, the inmates were still kept outdoors and in these temporary places. And then the first huge explosion was in the 1870s. Mm -hmm. This is when Melbourne became its own colony and it had just broken off from New South Wales and it decided it needed a, a new and big jail. And you've got to understand Victoria at the time were brand new. They were also flush with money. They were the richest city in the world. So Victoria thought, we've got to really show New South Wales that we've got this under control, that, that we've got crime under control, that we're a proper big new place, city, and we can govern themselves. So they built this monstrosity, which is Pentridge Prison. Everything is completely excessive. The walls are five metres high when they could have been three metres. There's turrets, there's towers. It looks like a castle. Absolutely. And it cost a fortune. But for the young government, it was a way of saying, if you come down to Melbourne and look at this, we look like we know what we're doing and that we've got everything under control. So it's very much a statement piece as much as it is a prison. Tell me about the women's prison at Pentridge. When did that start? Originally, it was just men, right? Yeah, it was originally just men and the women were kept in the old Melbourne jail. Mm -hmm. But the old Melbourne jail started becoming really run down. There were rats, it was infested. It was a real sort of horror place. And they started sending women out into Pentridge in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. And they originally used one of the men's blocks, they converted it. And there's a real fascinating story now about this new jail that gets built and it becomes a very famous jail. It's D Division. It was known as the Romare Prison. That's where the gallows were kept and the 11 inmates were executed, but it was built as a standalone woman's reformatory. And they started it in the 1880s and it actually took probably five years to build, but once it was built, it sat there for seven or eight years empty because of a dispute over the costs. Oh so gosh. only in Australia could you get something like that happening. And eventually um, it was cleared the way. And like the jail started 50 years before, they marched a gang of women from Melbourne jail all the way up to Pentridge. And it was quite a spectacle. Everyone came out in Melbourne to watch these women walk outside of Melbourne jail and they were catcalling and whistling and away they went. And anyway, they got up there and it was 198 cells, this huge, modern, brand new building. It still looks pretty good today. And they absolutely loved it. They got their own cells. It was clean. Life was great. But of course, about 10 years later, they decided that they needed it back for the men and they, they booted them out again and yeah, back to Melbourne jail and, and to other facilities. I want to touch on the story of Jean Lee. You focus on her a little bit in your book and the listeners would have heard her story a little bit at the start of this episode. She was the last woman judicially executed in Australia. I wanted you to tell us a little bit more about the context of her story because she said at the end that she was innocent. Yeah, so Jean confessed to the murder of Pops Kent. So the crime itself, an elderly man was beaten to death and strangled in his apartment in Melbourne and three people were arrested shortly after they were seen at his apartment. One of those was Jean Lee and the other two were her boyfriend and a mate. And while she was in custody, the interviewing process went on for about six or seven hours. They had them in there from about midnight till 7 a.m., and at about 6am, Jean Lee decided to confess. It's thought that her thinking at the end of the day was that she wouldn't be hung because she was a woman. It was mm. very rare for the state to execute women. And she thought that if she confessed, she'd save her lover from the noose. Long story short is they all hung. But the case gets really interesting because of that whole six or seven hours that I just talked about. If you looked at it now, it's absolutely terrible policing and nothing would stand up in court. It was all taken under duress. They actually were toing and throwing, bringing her partner in saying, look, you confessed, didn't you? Come on, you're going to dob her in. You're going to dob him in. Whereas nowadays you'd keep everyone separate. Yeah, yeah. So they gained the confession under duress and that's what was challenged in court. When, once they got in there, Jean Lee changed her tune and said she was innocent. They all said they were innocent and they all got hung. But there's no doubt all three were involved. It was this little sort of scam that they were running where Jean Lee would approach an elderly guy in a pub that seemed to have money. They'd pick a target and, yeah, she'd proposition him and, you know, obviously flirt with him. And then the other two would come in at the end of the night and nick all his money. And they'd been doing that throughout Melbourne during the, the Melbourne Cup 
period. Yep. That was the horse racing season. And if you look at a little bit of Jean Lee's history, she'd been in trouble in other states. So she wasn't innocent, but many people think that she didn't actually have a role in the actual killing itself, that she didn't exact any of the any of the violence against the man. But you've got to think about the circumstances back then. You get put on death row at Pentridge. That's where she was in the lead up. She was one of the only few women there. She was kept in isolation and she started going mad. As the date got nearer and nearer, the reality of what was going to happen hit her and she, yeah, became inconsolable. They actually had to drug her up most of those last weeks. And when time came for her actual hanging, she was comatose. The other two were a completely different story. They kind of marched out all jovial. They were the only people ever to be hung back to back in Australia, so they were dropped at the same time. And one of them just said, see you, mate. Bye, mate. Bang. Oh, wow. Drop dead. You mentioned that the gallows and where they were hung was actually inside a, a cell block. I'm struggling to get my head around what that looks like. Can you help paint the picture? I have to give you the whole story of the gallows. Okay, It's, it's quite fascinating. <laughs> so... They actually transferred the gallows from Melbourne Jail when it shut in 1930 to Pentridge Prison. And now when I say gallows, we're talking about a beam. Mm -hmm. So a huge big chunk of old timber that is hung across the rafters. They pulled that out of Melbourne Jail and took it to Pentridge. And why would they do that? It was to be intimidating. It was to be feared for them to say this is what Ned Kelly was hung on. All these people are going to die on that and that's what you'll die with. That'll be the implement of your death if you commit a capital crime in Victoria. So it was strung across from one side of D Division, which we talked about briefly before, Mm -hmm. to the other. So in the expanse between the cells. So it's literally just in full view. Yeah, it's right in the middle of the wing. And there's balconies on either side. The balconies on either side of the tier aren't connected, but where the gallows are, there's a bridge. You walk across that bridge and the beam's just above there and they hang the rope over there and the gallows is a trap door in that bridge. So you stand in the middle of the bridge and the hangman operates a lever, it drops that trap door and you're hung off that beam. How many people were executed at Pentridge over the years? There were 11, 11 executions at Pentridge. Which isn't actually that many. No, because... At Old Melbourne Jail, there were hundreds and hundreds, Mm -hmm. but it became at a time in, I guess, the turn of the century where people started saying, no, we don't want people executed. It it started over in in the UK. It was, let's reform these people, repent. As I said, it became a penitent system. It wasn't about punishment. It was about, about reform, and that's what eventually led to the death penalty being abolished, but it was too late for a poor guy called Ronald Ryan. And he was hung on that very gallows we're just talking about in 1967. If his case was a couple of months later, he wouldn't have hung. And what was his story? He actually was sentenced to death for an escape. And this is another great Pentridge story. So him and a guy called Walker escaped Pentridge. And on their way out, they nicked guns, they belted guards, they did the lot. And anyway, when they got out the front, shots were fired and a guard was killed. So Ronald was convicted and found guilty of killing that guard and sentenced to death, but the bullet was never found and the evidence surrounding it was very controversial. A lot of people suggest because of the angle and the fact that the bullet wasn't found that it was actually a guard that shot the fellow guard in crossfire and that does seem very plausible. But anyway, Ronald Ryan was hung for it and In the weeks leading up to his death, he was kept in H Division in the condemned cell. And I've spoken to people that were with him during that time. And literally, he didn't speak to anyone. He was kept completely isolated. His cell was open so everyone could see in. And he had a guard out there at all times. And it was a really horrible thing to know that you're going to die and have to spend that long thinking about it. You've touched on H Division. Let's go there. What was it? When did it start? What kind of things happened there? H Division, they call it hell, yeah, and it really was hell. So it opened after William O'Mealy tried to escape. He was the guy that was the last Australian to be flogged, and it was the house that was built for him. So there was such a reaction from the Victorian public because there was a string of escapes before that, and all of a sudden these really terrible criminals were on the loose in Melbourne and people started looking at the jail saying, why can't this jail contain them? So in a response, they built H Division. And at first it was to be a jail within a jail, like a supermax that was considered inescapable. 
and they sectioned off one of the wings, B wing, and it's not not a particular big area. And it's thirty nine cells, and they're tiny cells. And these inmates would be kept in there at all times. There was a yard off the back of that, which was also another jail in itself. And that was the premise of H Division. But what H Division became over the years was a torture chamber. So the guards quickly realised that they could make inmates in the rest of the jail behave if they threatened to send them to H. Mm -hmm. And if people came back from H into the other jail and said what happened. So they started belting prisoners and really torturing them. And that way, all the other inmates were terrified of H Division. And the process was... You'd be walked in there. There was a cross on the floor, which is still there today. You can go and see it. It's embroidered into the carpet. Be stripped naked, and then the reception biff would start. So you'd have six to ten screws absolutely wallop you. And that was your introduction to H Division? Introduction, and it got worse. That was physical punishment, but it was about humiliation more than anything. Mm. So they wanted to humiliate these guys. Once you were naked, they would walk you around the entire wing naked and slap you in the bum with a baton that was called the licorice mile. And what they wanted you to do was scream and say, stop and say, this hurts, because then the other inmates would target you as being weak. And that went on for up to three hours in some instances. And then you were thrown into this dog kennel size cell and kept there in isolation for 23 hours a day until they decided that you could be let out into the yard. And when I say let out into the yard... It was the size of a lounge room. There was 12 of them. They were walled areas with no roof, and you were let out there on your own. There was no other inmates in there, and it wasn't for recreation. It was to break rocks. So these blue stones would come through a chute. You'd have a sledgehammer, and for the first four hours, which was the morning, you'd smash these big boulders into little boulders. Then your lunch would be served for a trapdoor, get half an hour, and then for the rest of the day, you'd move on to a smaller hammer, and you'd chop those rocks that you'd already chopped down into gravel the size of your fingernail. And then at the end of the day, you'd be marched back in, and you didn't even get to shower. Showers were twice a week. So oh, That would that, have stunk in that place. Well, John Killick was in there in that period. I spoke to him for the book, and one of the things that really stuck with me was the smell and not showering, and I didn't really think it was a big deal until he said, no, it was probably the worst part because just the smell and the uncleanliness and being in a – an area that small and the Mm. dirt, and he said people would wash themselves with the toilet water. He said he never resorted to doing that, but that's what some people would do. This is not that long ago because H Division opened in 1958. Yeah, the period I'm talking about now with John Killick was 1966, 67, and, of course, it developed again over the years. A royal commission of sorts happened in the 70s, There was a big riot that made the headlines. Basically, the prisoners, it was over making buttons. The guards were trying to get them to work at night in their cells to make buttons. They had some sort of little deal going on while they were getting paid per their production process, and the inmates refused and refused to eat. And it was also the time of the Vietnam War. So a lot of people were going to prison for not you know, going to the war or for refusing to, Mm. to go, and it created a big legal campaign. So there was eyes on the prison. And, yeah, there was an inquiry into the prison system and H Division got exposed. So it was a bit of a whitewash. They really only exposed what they want, but enough got exposed that things got better for a little while. In the 80s, it crept back in and at the time that Chopper Reed and co were in there for the Overcoat Wars, it was, again, a horrible place. And I've got a first-hand account from a guy that was in there in 1988 and he's probably the most horrific story in H Division And he's actually going through a case at the moment where all this is coming to light and he's going to receive the payout for the torture, the sexual assault that happens in H Division. And, you know, there's two sides to the story. I've spoken to officers in there and you've got to understand that these officers were guarding the worst of the worst. So over the years, Paul Stephen Hay, who's a serial killer that's killed seven people, as many as Ivan Milat, the Hoodle Street massacrist, Knight, you've got Craig Minogue, the Russell, up, Street bomber. Russell Street bomber, Chopper Reed. You've got Greg Brazel, who was another serial killer that teamed up with him. Jimmy Luffman was one of the most violent criminals in Victoria. And these guards, you know, were putting their life on the line every day. So, yeah, they, they kind of admit that they, you know, would give them a bit when they needed it. They had to. So, you know, with something like this, you find that the truth's probably somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And I don't doubt that these horrors went on. 
at the end of the day, we can't deny it was a completely barbaric place and we're better for it not being there. You've thrown out a few names there. I want to touch on a few of them. Chopper Reed, he was there before he was famous. Chopper, he's <laughs> uh, one of the most interesting stories. I was a little bit reticent about doing a book on Pentridge. That's probably why it's taken me so long. I did four jail books very early in my career and it's been seven years since the last one came out. And the reason I steered away from Pentridge was because of Chopper and Ned Kelly. Two of the biggest names in Australian crime, I didn't think I'd be able to get anything new on them. But that wasn't the case. The history's all been distorted and rearranged in timelines and Chopper has invented a lot of it himself. So until he wrote his book in 1990, nobody knew who Chopper Reed was. And you've got to understand he spent his whole life in Pentridge before 1990. I think that's fascinating because everyone knows that name, like yeah. Chopper Reed. But back then, he was the no one. There's a newspaper article from 1984 when he jumped out and went on to the top of a roof. It was probably the second time he'd appeared in print. He was referred to as an unemployed labourer from South Yarra. <laughs> so forget celebrity criminal, forget most infamous gangster, forget standover man. He was an unemployed labourer. That's how low key he was. Let's talk about Ned. For those that don't know his involvement with Pentridge. Give us a little bit of a background. Okay, so Ned, he was in Pentridge, believe it or not. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah. They only associate old Melbourne Jail with Ned, but he was actually jailed there when he was a teenager, mm. so 16 years of age. Now, not a lot of first-hand documentation exists about this, so I looked as hard as I could, and pretty much it's all just hearsay, no firm reports. There's not even a jail ledger with his name on it, but he was most certainly there, and he did it tough, so... There was rumours of bastardisation and different tortures. You can imagine being a 16-year-old in that place at that time. It wouldn't have been easy. And whatever happened to him, it, it did shape him for who he'd become later in life and his resentment towards authority and police. And that's where his story ends at Pentridge until 1930. Yeah. So long after his death, he's buried in the ground at Melbourne Jail and all of a sudden they decide to exhume all the bodies when the jail shuts and move them to Pentridge. So that process began. And anyway, Ned Kelly had a grave marker, and over the years everyone has been to Pentridge to pay their tributes to the outlaw. He's pretty famous and stood over this grave. And then when Pentridge was shut and the redevelopment began, they needed to exhume those bodies again. They went to dig up Ned. Guess what? Ned wasn't there. Nobody was. Those graves had been moved again and nobody knew where. So there's this fascinating story about how a team of archaeologists uncovered Ned Kelly's grave and went on this search. It took seven years and there's this intriguing sidebar to it of Ned Kelly's skull. So aside from his body being missing, his skull had allegedly been nicked from the old Melbourne jail in 1978. So there was this glass cabinet and in it was a skull that had E. Kelly skull. So everyone thought that was Ned's skull. And in 1978, a guy called Tom Baxter nicked it from Melbourne jail and then rang up the next day to the police and newspapers saying he'd return it if Ned was given a, a proper burial in consecrated ground. That didn't happen and that story went cold. But all of a sudden, when they couldn't find Ned's body, the archaeologists were a little bit stumped this Tom Baxter resurfaces after all these years and goes, do you want Ned's head? And the archaeologist said, yes, of course. And he eventually got the skull back. They did DNA testing on the skull. And again, not Ned's skull. So for all these years, people had been going and looking at this skull before it was Ned. It's not Ned. It wasn't Ned's. And then they had a theory it was actually Frederick Deeming's. And this is a very interesting case as well because a lot of crime buffs would know he's alleged to be Jack the Ripper. So he was a, a guy from the UK that moved over just after all the Jack the Ripper murders mm -hmm. and as soon as he got to Australia, murders of a very similar nature. So he was trialled and hung for killing three women in similar circumstances. They thought it was his skull. So they went on this huge international campaign. They found Demix relatives in the UK, got DNA off them, actually had to exhume some bodies in the UK wasn't him either. So uh, this skull that old Tom Baxter had and was holding it to ransom for all those years could have been anybody's. So where is Ned Kelly's body? They uncovered various plots in different places and they worked out things had been moved over the years. There was a swimming pool put in at one point and there was drainage works. Anyway, they kept on thinking they had it and they'd bring up more bodies, think it was Ned and it would never be Ned. And they gave up. And then when the Pentridge redevelopment got into full swing – 
a bobcat driver hit something. And if you know what bobcat drivers are like, they don't usually stop. It's rip, <laughs> rip, rip. And he knew about the story of Ned. They all knew about the story of Ned and it made them a little bit cautious. And anyway, as soon as he hit it, he stopped. He went and saw his boss and they stopped work and got the archaeologists out and it turns out it was Ned Kelly and not just Ned Kelly. His body was the most intact skeleton out of all the Pentridge burials. Wow. They ended up going through all the remains and there was skull fragments in the box and they were able to determine that they conducted phrenology on Ned Kelly's head, which was this archaic science where they'd examine the skull for bumps and bruises and apparently that could determine if you're a psychopath or not. And they cut it up and threw it back in. And because of those cuts and incisions, the skull actually deteriorated in the coffin. That was the only part. Uh-huh. But yeah, the bullet was still in his arm from Glen Rowan and leg. And this was fairly recently, right? Yeah, yeah. This was 2011. Yeah, wow. There are so many stories that you have found from Pentridge that I, I think audibly gasped. <laughs> There's an inmate who chopped off his own penis. Oh, Gary David, yeah. These inmates are quite common, believe it or not. When I first heard of the term self-mutilator or self-harmer, back when I was writing my first prison book, I thought, no, this doesn't exist. And no, it's quite common. People harm themselves in prison for attention a lot of the time. Other people do it because they're completely batshit crazy. Mm -hmm. Gary David was a little bit of everything. He was in Pentridge. He was in there for attempted murder. He allegedly attempted to murder three guys, but actually didn't go through with it. But he became known as the most violent prisoner in the Victorian prison system, so much so that Victoria made the unprecedented move to change the law just to keep him in jail past his maximum sentence. It was a huge outrage at the time. And until this book was published, no one knew the incident that caused them to think that he was so violent because he'd never committed violence against anyone else. It was violence against himself. It was him chopping off his own penis. And he, like, presented it to a guy. Yeah, I've interviewed the guy. was an inmate. It was a 17-year-old named Glenn Broom. He was delivering the meals. He put his tray up on the ledge and said, meals up, and he hears cocks up, and bang, slammed down on the tray with a severed and mutilated penis. And this poor kid, Broom, he was absolutely brutalised. He still he still struggles a little bit. Like, people just laugh at things like that, even though it's absolutely it's not funny. Yeah, and he got presented with that and then looked inside the the peephole. He was stunned and shocked still, looked inside and saw this guy standing there with a big hole in his groin, blood everywhere, and he was laughing, not just laughing. It was an evil cackle from a demented man, and that's the image that sat with Glenn all these years. And they ended up reattaching his penis, but they shouldn't have bothered because he chopped it off again soon after. Stop. Yeah, and they didn't save it the next time. So he ended up dying in Ararat Prison, which is a a mental facility from blood infection because he had so many open wounds across his body that there was no way that they could be closed. It's basically when you cut yourself that many times, there's nothing you can do to to re-bond the skin. Skin will no longer grow. So you can, with a touch, open yourself up, and that's where he was at. He was swallowing razor blades. So he was unwell, right? Like. You can't be mentally sane. Another thing about the prison system, it's very hard to be classified insane. So he was never considered a mental patient. So the law was actually passed. It was the first of its kind, a real big deal because it was a civil rights atrocity. They sentenced him to a year's jail without even being accused of a crime, let alone convicted of one. So when his release date came up, He was given another year for a crime he hadn't committed, and it was just called because of community safety. But if he was insane, they could have kept him. I've argued that if that was the case, he probably would have been in a facility where he was cared for and treated. And protected from from, himself. From day one. These things wouldn't have happened if he was receiving mental care instead of being in a prison, but he was never classified insane. There's another story I want to talk about. You did mention his name before. Paul Stephen Hay, he was a serial killer who got sent to prison in 1979 and he painted himself with poo. It's not a sentence I thought I'd ever say, but why? So he's a serial killer, an absolutely vile individual that murdered women, children, all just for his self-gain and to keep himself out of jail, which obviously didn't work. And now this was another part of his manipulation. He wanted to declare himself insane. So he covered himself in his own feces. 
walked out to the yard with a sheet, climbed up the fence and was threatening to hang himself. So he wrote me this in a letter. No one's ever known this before. And he said he did this, yeah, to claim insanity. Mind you, this guy, he's the only guy that's ever given me nightmares. So Really? Yeah. In his interviews and letters, he recounted his crimes for the first time and admitted to them. So he was always innocent, of course, but all of a sudden he's told me, you know, he's given up. He knows he's never getting out and he, he went into details and, you know, sitting there late at night reading for the first time in a one-on-one letter about him telling me about how he dug the holes and where he put the bullets in the back of the head and who did what, yeah, really shook me up. And, yeah, I'm glad he's never getting out, put it that way. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Barth. I'm speaking with author James Phelps about Australia's most infamous jail, Pentridge Prison. I want to talk about another division that was opened in 1980, Jika Jika. What was it for? Jika Jika was originally supposed to be a replacement for H Division. So it was going to be the new and improved prison. And it was actually a little bit to do with a jail that was built in Sydney at the time. So a bit of competition. So in Sydney at Long Bay in 1978, a place called Katingal was opened. And it was labelled the most high-tech prison in the world. It was a prison that used surveillance cameras, electronic doors, air conditioning. It was just, you know, completely high-tech Guards had very little interaction with the inmates. Everything was just you were pushed through by voice commands. So they thought, we want one too. So they came up to Katingal, had a look, went back and started building it. Now, this is where the story gets interesting. Katingal was only open for four months. An escape happened and then some eyes got put on it and it got labelled the biggest human rights disaster ever. It was completely archaic in terms of the separation and the sterileness and the inmates were going crazy, walking around in circles, everything was white, and it got shut down. Before Bef- Jaika Before Jaika Jika was finished. open, but they'd already built it, so they committed all this money. So they just went la-di-da-di-da, pretended that none of that happened. Then all of a sudden Jaika Jaika opens and, of course, yeah, all the same things start going on. And it got to a stage where inmates hated it that much. They'd do anything to get out. And a group of prisoners, yeah, ended up setting fire to their own cell in a bid to get out. Seven of them burnt to death in there and the whole Jika Jika was shut afterwards, never to be reopened. And one of those guys that died in that fire was Jimmy Loughlin, Chopper's good mate. He was part of the trio that actually planned and executed that fire. And the purpose of that fire was to just try and get out. They weren't trying to die. It was yeah. just the, the way that building had been built. There's a little bit of debate about that because the guy that actually was the ringleader, he was told two days before that he wasn't getting moved out of Jika. So he'd been told that yeah, he'd get moved to another prison and then he was told that he'd stay in Jika for the rest of his life and he was the one that instigated the fire. And I think he was a little bit more intelligent than the others. He knew what could happen, but the whole reason they died was because of the air system. So there was no fresh air in there, no opening windows. All the oxygen was through a recycled system and they thought that they might be able to survive. They pulled some pipes out of the, the washing machines and they stuck them into the into the sink and they were trying to breathe the air through the sink, but it was all part of the same air system. So as soon as that fire started... Yeah, it wasn't a blazing inferno. What it was was they'd got computer paper, computers, bed sheets, basically anything that could burn and lit it on fire and it was enough to send this toxic smoke everywhere and the guards were watching but not really because it was they didn't have any interaction. They never went in there. They were scared to go in there. It could all operate by letting doors through on cameras. So they kind of let them collect all this stuff and let them do what they want and... Yeah, and eventually they couldn't get in there when the fire started because they'd used a tennis net wire to lock the door. So Pentridge Prison actually closed in 1997, if I'm correct. Yep. Why did it end up closing? The damage was done. It mm. was just became a place that it was so infamous and had this reputation that it didn't matter what they did to the jail to clean it up. After H Division, after Jika Jika, after the Crystal Palace, After Chopper Reed, it became a stain on the criminal justice system and 
they decided they had to get away from it and build a brand new modern prison, you know, facilitate these guys. So they built Barwon Prison and an, another jail, Port Phillip, and shut Pentridge down. And then that left them with the problem. It's a huge estate. We're yeah. talking like it goes around two suburbs. What to do with it? It became a redevelopment, and a lot of people were a bit wary of that, thinking who'd who'd want to go do their shopping or live in an apartment complex in that prison. But it's actually really cool, really vibe sort of happening precinct now. There's a hotel built on the top of B Division, and one of the E Divisions been converted into a microbrewery where you can go and have all this fancy beer and food. And it's funny, I interviewed a lot of the the inmates there. They'd come and visit me while staying at the hotel and we'd walk around the Pentridge village to get their thoughts. Inmates are no longer welcome at Pentridge. So the looks that these guys were given by the people that now live there and walk around oh. there, mums with their prams and hipsters and cardigans, and all of a sudden you got this guy with no teeth and a bum bag and tattoos walking around and so the looks that these guys were given as they walked through their old yards of Pantry Jail was just astounding. It was quite unbelievable. There are also ghost tours there? Yeah, I went on one of those ghost tours. Are you a believer? My next book is called Australian Hauntings. I'm going to do the great ghost stories of Australia. Yeah, we'll find out once I do this book if I'm a believer or not, but... Yeah, a lot of theatrics in the Pentridge Ghost Tour. The, the the lady that runs it comes out with ghost makeup on and <laughs> boos you and you know, scares and most of the things that are set up there aren't real. For example, you got taken to a cell where, according to the tour, Ed Lewinsky was housed. He was an American soldier. She opened the door and there was a pentagram on the floor and she said he was a satanic worshipper and for all his time here he was you know conjuring things and he haunts the place. The real story is Edward Lewinsky never spent a night in Pentridge. He was kept on a military base by oh, the okay. US Army and he was only brought there to be hung. So, I have heard that Jean Lee is a ghost at Pentridge still. According to the inmates and the guards that I asked about the ghost, there's possibly two ghosts. Okay. And one of them is a female figure in D-Wing. They don't think it's Jean Lee. They think it was one of the nurses because apparently from the silhouette there's a nurse's hat like in the old style. Mm -hmm. And there's also a small figure which a lot of people think was a boy and maybe one of the sons of the, the women that were incarcerated back there in that early period we talked about before because they did have their children there at point sometimes. But other people have told me this, this horrible case of a little person that was incarcerated. It was a man that was only about four foot tall and he died in that wing in the area where this apparition appears. So they're the two ghosts that I would say are there, if any are there. Mm -hmm. But it's funny, I never got that feeling once about that place and really? a lot of inmates I've spoken to are just doesn't have that vibe. And you'd think if any place in the world or any place in Australia was haunted, it's going to be Pantridge Prison with that history we've just talked about. So lastly, you know, we've kind of touched on a little bit of the history that you have spent so long looking into, 147 years of it. Probably a big question, but what have you taken away from looking into Pentridge? I guess the biggest thing for me was the fact that it was such a intimidating, horrible place. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a big part of our history. I always thought that Long Bay in Sydney was the hardest jail in Australia. I probably have to say that Pentridge is now, or if not, they were of, of equal. It's always been a part of Victoria. And speaking of Victorians, they live in the shadows of this place. Everybody has a story about it. Everyone used to drive past it. And it really is, you know, not just infamous. It's a famous bit of Australian land and a landmark. Thanks to James for assisting us to tell this story. If you'd like to learn more about the stories from behind the walls of Pentridge Prison, you can find his book linked in the show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted and produced by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you enjoyed this episode, let us know. Leave us a rating or review in your favourite podcast app, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever else you're listening right now. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation. 